Now on BBC World News, Philippa Thomas hears from people around the world about their extraordinary experiences during the pandemic and how COVID-19 has changed their lives. Welcome to Coronavirus Your Stories, a programme about how COVID-19 is changing the lives of people around the world. I'm Philippa Thomas. This week we're talking about birth and death. I'll be hearing from a British doctor whose job it is to talk to the dying about the ways this pandemic has transformed end-of-life care. But first, what the virus is doing to significantly change the experience of childbirth for women around the world. When we give birth, most of, most of us want our partners to be with us. We want to be able to see the faces of midwives and doctors. We want to feel a sense of touch, not just for medical reasons, but for that sense of human connection. What if all that is gone? New mum Janina White in Tampa Bay, Florida, had her little boy Leo three months ago. In Karachi, Pakistan, Neha Mankani manages a team of community midwives at a rural birthing center. Can I come to you first, Janina? What's it been like with a newborn in lockdown? It's really hard for um, myself and to not have a support team, to not just have anybody pop over, um, like family or friends or anything. Um, and um, it's a little bit more lonely than a normal new motherhood would be. Yeah, for a first time mother, I guess you'd normally have expected to be having family and friends popping in and, and midwives or health visitors. Yeah, um, and that doesn't really happen. Um, it's more over the phone, um, calling, and um, just, just my mom pops over because she quarantined herself. So um, that's about it. Neha in Karachi, as a midwife, and for the midwives that you're managing, how different has it been in this time of coronavirus? So it's been a scary time for midwives, and I think this is true of midwives and healthcare providers all over the world, but Pakistan is now at that point where, with COVID where our health systems are crumbling. And midwives have had it hard for a number of reasons, and a lot of it is about because of the uncertainty and fear around the pandemic. People, midwives, then are scared for their jobs, for their health, for their families. And they're scared of, it's, they're actually scared of being able to do their job properly. Um, I think a lot of this is because midwives aren't considered frontline healthcare workers. So in a lot of places, they don't have access to PPE. They're not provided with masks and other basic protective care. Janina, how does it feel to you hearing that midwives aren't considered key workers? It's, it's just crazy, obviously, because they're so important. And... Um, especially, you know, right after having the baby, I can't even imagine um, not having the ability to speak to my OBGYN or anything, and um, especially because there's no one else to speak to. So, you know, you rely on your doctor even more. So, Janina, I think you were able to have your husband Corey with you for Leo's birth, but it hasn't been, e even that has been taken away for quite a lot of other new mothers. Yeah, so my birth was one of the last, my, my week, and then after um, my birth, they took away the ability to have your husband or any partner, um, and you have to wear a mask to deliver. So I can imagine the girls after me, um, it's a lot more stressful. I luckily was one of the last to have at least one visitor and my husband. And I hear you, Janina, talking about your experience, but obviously you're in touch with other new mums or, or women who are about to be uh, mothers. Get, I'm getting this sense of just high stress and stress levels going up and down with the, the uncertainty of it all. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult to know what process or what journey you're going to have because it changes every day. For example, when I went into the hospital, it changed that night and I, I didn't even know walking into the hospital that it was going to change. So my sister-in-law is about to deliver in August and every single day we chat about how she has no idea what the hospital is going to be like in August and that's only, you know, two months away. So she's, she's stressed out um, and I can imagine. I'm thankful that mine is done and over with and you know because every every day is a gamble. 
Neha, what are you hearing from your midwives at the, the birthing centre about whether women are worried about coming to the birthing centre or the kind of state they're in? So, yeah, women are really worried about coming in and just like midwives are anxious about providing care, women are really anxious about attending clinics. And this has been a big issue for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of women have started missing their antenatal appointments uh, because they're not, they don't, they're not going to come to the health center where, they, where they're scared that they might contract something. Um, and not, a lot of women also are choosing to deliver at home, but not with midwives. A lot of them are choosing to deliver with traditional birth attendants who are not qualified to provide maternity care. And a lot of these births have devastating outcomes because of the fact that they're being done at home without any infection prevention. Janina, hearing about women giving birth at home, do you think that's possibly happening more where you are as well? Definitely. Um, I'm still in a mother group and a lot of girls during my um, birth were dropping out to have birth at home just because they wanted their partner. They didn't know if it would change the day they went in. Also, you're in Florida, and we've been hearing this week about the numbers still rising in Florida. I think more than 100,000 cases. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's very stressful. So we don't really, we were leaving the house a little bit, but we don't as much. Um, I mean, it went from two times a week to maybe one now. And now we just kind of ride around in the car to get an escape, and we don't really go anywhere just because I don't want to expose Leo to any of that. Neha, infection still rising in Pakistan as well, I think. What are you hearing from mothers and midwives? Have, have you heard of cases of COVID-19? Yes, so, because, so right now our cases are definitely still going up. No signs of them coming down anytime soon. <clears throat> We're also seeing that a lot of women, because of this, are being turned away from hospitals because a lot of uh, hospitals that cater to that are maternity hospitals are not equipped to manage COVID cases because the staff there are not trained or they don't have the required resources. So a lot of COVID patients are being turned away when they don't have a place to deliver. Neha, that means women are in more dangerous situations than they would have been before COVID. Oh, absolutely, yeah, because it just takes away a really something that was considered safe, something that a lot of people could take for granted. They aren't able to anymore. And I mean, I'm in this sector, so I'll get a call every two days from someone saying that, you know, I, someone I know is trying to get to a hospital and their hospital has refused to take them. Or I spoke to this woman who was about to give birth and she was at a hospital and she told me that in the middle of her pregnancy, it was a very high risk pregnancy, she, her blood pressure went up a lot and she said, I went to the facility that I was supposed to deliver at and they said, sorry, we've had a lot of cases. A lot of our doctors and midwives are sick, so we're not letting anyone in right now. And it led to eventually her blood pressure kept going up. She went to three hospitals. She was turned away, and eventually she had suffered from an eclamptic fit. And this was something that was very avoidable, but it's just with the health system crumbling, no one really knows how to deal with these things. And Neha, there's also the question of cost, because people obviously are losing their jobs, their livelihoods around the world because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. but getting hospital or birthing services costs money. A lot of people have lost their jobs and a lot of these people had saved for their deliveries. They don't have the money anymore. Um, so part of what I do, so I manage this organization called Mama Baby Fund and Mama Baby Fund bridges financial emergencies that people experience during the maternity care process. And I've started getting a lot of cases of people who say, who had who have to deliver or they have to have a c-section or they need blood or their baby needs to go into a NICU and they said that we don't have anything so a lot of them are just choosing to you know some of them will choose to take a baby out of a NICU some of them will choose to go to a health facility that may not be as good but everyone's resources have just become a lot more limited so that's also contributing to the quality of care that people are receiving. Janina in Florida or in the United States do you think money is a factor as well because health insurance costs a lot? Yes, for sure. Um, a lot of people are losing their jobs. Thankfully, I haven't. Um, I'm a teacher, but I was on maternity leave and my husband uh, didn't lose his job either. But um, I can't even imagine. I'm just listening to her story. I can't even imagine um, being turned away or not being able to afford something. Uh, it's really scary. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't even know what I would do in that situation. 
Janina, what would your advice be for other very new mothers or those who are about to have their babies? It's very overwhelming and um, I know it can feel lonely or it can feel, you know, you get exasperated because, you know, you're just exhausted with everything happening. Just, I, I would say, just take it one day at a time. Janina White in Florida and Neha Mankani in Karachi, Pakistan, sharing their experiences of birth and midwifery. Next, I'll be talking to a doctor whose job it is to talk to the dying and hear how she tries to connect her patients with families who can no longer be in the room. One water pump for thousands of people. This water is relatively clean, but is fertile ground for coronavirus infections. As countries start to reopen, the challenge will be getting people back into these empty department stores and restaurants. All of this opening up is happening, even as Moscow is detecting more than 2,000 new coronavirus cases every single day. We break stories from more places than any other international news broadcaster. We are the leaders in global breaking news. With travel restrictions in place across the globe, we're inviting you to revisit some of our special journeys and favourite destinations. Coming to you from the jungle in northern Rwanda. So why not join us from the comfort and safety of your home for our pick of virtual vacations. Check this out. I was not expecting this at all. That's with me, Raj and Datar, and the Travel Show team here on BBC World News. Welcome back. I'm Philippa Thomas and this is Coronavirus Your Stories, a programme about how COVID-19 is changing the lives of people around the world. Next, we're talking to an English doctor who has the most difficult job of all, to speak to those who are dying, to treat them, to connect with them, to comfort them as they come to the end of their lives. Rachel Clark moved from her job in a hospice to work in hospital wards to get closer to those affected. Everything transformed in the last few months and the majority of patients that I've been seeing in, in the hospital where I work have been very frail, overwhelmed very quickly by the illness. Uh, sometimes they're so short of breath, they're struggling so hard to breathe, they can barely talk at all and we almost have to communicate using gestures so they, they nod and shake their head to communicate with me um, and it's a real challenge wearing our PPE, our, our personal protective equipment to communicate with the kind of care and compassion that you'd normally like to because you have literal physical barriers between you and your patients but we all try our utmost to, to convey that care and convey that every single patient matters. It's a bit of a unique situation, isn't it? Because if you're dying and you can't touch anyone and you can't properly see anybody around you, that is really brutal. Absolutely. And I think that is one of the great cruelties of this disease, the fact that the infection control measures not only put up these physical barriers between doctors and carers and their patients, so we have to be separated from them by gloves and masks and visors, but also family members very often have to be kept away. So although in, in my hospital we are now able to allow one, possibly two members of, of a family to visit a loved one right at the end of life, that's only very recently been the case. And so the tragedy uh, as this pandemic has unfolded has been people in their hour really of greatest need when they really desperately want another human presence, ideally someone they love and cherish at their bedside. Those people haven't been there. And so it has fallen onto us, the healthcare professionals to try and fill that role. We can never replace a loved one but we can be there and we can kneel down, we can hold people's hands, we can tell them that they care about them, they matter to us, and at least there is a way of communicating some of that human warmth and compassion that's so important when anyone's vulnerable, but particularly at the end of life. What more do you do to try to 
make that connection between the patient who's right in front of you, Rachel, and the family who very often isn't or can't be? Well, we have learned really on the job, as it were. We've had to make it up as we go along and we've tried to be creative and imaginative to help patients make those human connections and feel cared for even in the absence of loved ones. So a lot of conversations will happen over a tablet or a smartphone so a loved one can be there in the room via a tablet and communicate with their relative. Uh, and sometimes we use symbols, symbolic gestures that can be enormously powerful. So, so if we know a patient is approaching the end of life in my hospital, um, a whole series of volunteers in the local community have made little red hearts that they have crocheted out of wool. And we will place a red heart somewhere in the room and we will show it to the family who can't be there on, on a tablet so they can see that as a symbol of, of care and love. And then when that patient dies, we will give another of those hearts to the family. So it's a symbolic way of showing that the connection and the love has been there. And sometimes a family will choose to take back the heart that they knew was there in the final days with the patient who was suffering from coronavirus and so they bring them back together again and can keep both of them and all of those little gestures on the one hand are only small they're only symbols but actually they can be incredibly important and and i have spoken to family members who say that those gestures mean everything because they're a way of knowing that for all their loved one feels a million miles away, they actually know that they're in an environment with doctors and nurses who care about them deeply. And when you're speaking to family members, do you get asked, I think I would feel this, um, how to have a conversation with somebody who's dying? Because there is a fear of saying the wrong thing or being inappropriate at this really important moment people are often incredibly apprehensive about saying the wrong thing to somebody whose time is limited and, and, and who we know is approaching the end of their life. They think if they get the words wrong or they're clumsy or inarticulate, they may somehow make things worse. And if there was one message I, I could communicate to people as widely as possible, it's that in my experience as a palliative care doctor, really nothing could be further from the truth that the one thing patients crave more than anything is to know that people care about them that they love them that they're surrounded by care and compassion and you can communicate that that with the clumsiest most inarticulate words imaginable you don't have to be eloquent you don't have to say something beautiful if all you say to somebody is I love you desperately and I don't want to lose you and I'm so, so sorry this is happening to you. That's a clear and powerful message and that's what people want to hear. I can't imagine any more emotionally intense work. And with COVID-19, there have been so many cases, so many people dying so quickly. How do you manage? How do you cope at the end of a day of these sorts of conversations? There are moments when I have to make myself just steely hard, hard as nails, because it's the only way I can do that job. And in that moment, my feelings don't matter at all. It's only the patient and their families that matter. You can do that because you're trained to do it. But I think at the end of the day, sometimes you come home and you feel utterly bereft because you have a sense that this is happening over and over again in hospitals up and down the country. There have been times when I've had to pull over on the side of the road and actually stop driving on the way home and sit there and cry to myself in silence inside my car because I have felt so shocked by the, the speed of the pandemic and the relentlessness of it, the sheer numbers of people who are dying too quickly and too often. It's like nothing any of us have ever experienced. It's like a, a battlefield environment. But you cry because you can't really take that home to your family. How can they understand what you're going through? 
and then you get up the next day and you go back in because there are patients who need you and that's the job you do. We do hear everyday statistics but that is a potent reminder that of course we're talking about individuals, we're talking about people and you are seeing some real desperation and despair and resilience I suppose from from families but but you are seeing emotions in the raw Rachel. I remember one um, family who I took to to um, siblings to see their dying parent and one of the siblings turned to me suddenly consumed with very understandable anger and said I don't want him to be a statistic I do not want him to be a statistic he's my father and I knew and he knew that tomorrow in all likelihood his father would be included in the daily statistics he would be one of the 500 people who had died the day before and it was heartbreaking because to these two siblings, this was a father, this was a, a, a colossus, someone they had adored for their entire life and they didn't want to see him being reduced to a number. So the statistics I think can be terribly painful for bereaved families to hear. Rachel, I'd like to end at the beginning in a way, and I don't quite know how to phrase this, but I'm talking to you as a palliative care specialist and the sense I get from what you do is that COVID is bringing us deaths in unimaginable numbers, but we shouldn't turn away from the fact of death and the process of dying. Yes, I, I, I think that, that there's no denying the fact that the last six months have been stunningly traumatic for, for us all as we have been through this pandemic. But I don't believe it's it's wholly bleak. I think in times of upheaval and uncertainty, we actually learn and we can discover profoundly important truths about how we want to live our lives, who we want to be, how we want to do things differently. And I think this pandemic, in a sense, is a little bit like my work in a hospice with patients who are approaching the end of their life only writ large on a global scale and, and by that I mean that patients who know they are dying have this extraordinary capacity very often to really savour the time they have left, really focus on what matters, what's important and all the things that we know deep down matter to us like the love of our friends and family, compassion, kindness, um, how we relate to each other, all of that comes centre stage. And I think we have seen that happen with coronavirus as well. I think people have, be, have behaved remarkably compassionately towards each other. We have been a community, in a way, a global community like never before. And that has been uh, for me, a startlingly uplifting thing to witness, even in these times of bleakness and darkness. I think there's a lot to learn from the last six months, and I hope, perhaps more than anything, that we don't forget it, that we carry what we've learned through into our future and think, how do we want to do things differently from this point on? Rachel Clark, a doctor who dedicates her working life to the dying. I'm Philippa Thomas. Thank you for joining us for this week's Coronavirus Your Stories.